Good afternoon, everyone. I see people are just starting to sign on and coming on in. I want to welcome you to our celebration of the 20th anniversary of the University of Minnesota Stem Cell Institute. My name is Brenda Ogle, and I'm the current director of the Stem Cell Institute. And before COVID, we had grand plans for celebrating this 20th anniversary event. Um, but the only one that we thought we could execute would be fun and informative virtually was this lunch and learn with our community. And so even without the lunch, we're very glad to have you here and we owe you one. We'll do it some other time when we can be in person. So please settle in, enjoy the live on-screen program and while you peruse the digital program, which I hope you received yesterday. So there are several goals for our program today. First, for those of you who are new to the Stem Cell Institute, we want to take the opportunity to share with you why the Institute was established 20 years ago and what we look like today. For those of you who are more familiar with the Stem Cell Institute, we want to take the opportunity to thank you for your engagement and support because 20 years ago, the University of Minnesota Medical School and therefore in part the citizens of Minnesota had the foresight to invest in a new research and technology that they predicted might emerge from a new and novel concept, which was that stem cells could be removed from the body, grown up in large numbers, and coaxed to become nearly all of the cell types in the human body. And this investment came in the form of a physical space. We had new equipment, new faculty, and new training programs. And it was, in fact, the first institute in the United States dedicated to stem cell research. Today, our mission is the same. We're very committed to conducting basic uh, science, basic research to better understand stem cell behavior and biology to advance regenerative medicine therapies for devastating diseases and disorders. The other piece of our mission is to provide education and training for the stem cell scientists of tomorrow. So if we could advance, Jesse. Today, this is our physical space. <clears throat> We've grown since its inception, of course, and now we're at nearly 60 faculty who participate or are part of our institute. And also, excitingly, we've expanded to include an innovation space where brand new companies interest and established companies interested in joining the stem cell biotech field can reside and interact with our uh, stem cell institute faculty members and staff. But the Institute extends well beyond the walls of this building. Um, <clears throat> as I mentioned, we have almost 60 faculty from across the university that collaborate on stem cell based research projects and train the next generation of stem cell scientists. <clears throat> Excuse me. I can go to the next slide. This slide just shows you an overview of some of our formal training programs that you might be interested in. The first is a master's of science in stem cell biology. Secondarily, we have a PhD minor in stem cell biology and also what we call a stem cell training program. This training program is special because it's funded by the National Institutes of Health and it supports PhD students with a unique interdisciplinary approach to coursework and hands-on training in stem cell research. So I invite you to check out um, the links to these programs if you'd like, they're in your, um, your written uh, program. And then at the end of our time together, I'll also show you a short video clip about our master's program. Go ahead, Jesse. So as I've already mentioned, the other half of our mission is research. Um, we're trying to better understand stem cell biology, especially stem cells that have been isolated from the body. We're trying to understand how they make decisions, how they decide to move or not, uh, under what conditions they might die. Um, and the cues that they receive that help promote their maturation so that they can perform some of the complex functions that they need to perform in the human body. I think sometimes these studies seem very far removed from stem cell therapeutics that you may be hearing about in the community. Um, but time and again, we see that the success of clinical trials, whether they be for stem cells, medical devices, drugs, have a much higher propensity for success if we understand the mechanism of action. So that's what we'll, we're ultimately trying to do at the Stem Cell Institute. Um, and it can be challenging um, to garner resources for basic studies like this, um, but several of you have invested substantial resources in our work and anniversaries like this are a perfect 
time to say thank you. And that's exactly what I want to say. And in addition, I've asked Nathan Brown, who comes to us from the University of Minnesota Foundation, to provide a few more details and also to help me extend and the rest of the Institute extend our gratitude. Jesse. Thank you, Dr. Ogle. Uh, again, my name is Nathan Brown, and I'm the Stem Cell Institute's philanthropic partner here at the University of Minnesota Foundation, uh, which means I have the privilege of working with donors, foundations, and corporate partners to secure resources for what we do here. Because um, again, before we can translate uh, new regenerative medicine treatments in the clinic, we have to start with basic science because it's the foundation of everything we do. And philanthropy has been critical to this mission. In fact, over the last 20 years, uh, it's been a cornerstone of our success. And so we do want to take a moment to thank those of you who have partnered with us. And I'll say there are so many donors to thank, and I wish we could uh, name everyone by name. But just to highlight a few that have made a, a unique impact on our work here. Um, uh, first, William or Bill and Nadine McGuire gave to, to help with the construction of the McGuire Translational Research Facility, where much of our research is housed. Uh, the Richard M. Schultz Family Foundation established the Schultz Diabetes Institute, a close partner of the Stem Cell Institute. Uh, they gave to support regenerative skin research and much more. Um, we also want to thank the state of Minnesota uh, through Regenerative Medicine Minnesota. Our legislators have seen the promise of the work that we do and have chose to prioritize it. And for that, we are very grateful. Uh, Jeff and Elizabeth Zucker and their company, My Directives, uh, has supported our muscular dystrophy research. And the Helen Lindsay Family Foundation have been champions of our macular degeneration research. Uh, so there, again, there are many more, but those are just a few that we want to highlight. Um, and so as we uh, are grateful for the past 20 years of support and then look ahead to the next 20 years, um, it's my hope that we can continue to deepen the connection between the Stem Cell Institute and the community. Uh, so in the coming weeks, I, I will be reaching out to, to some of you who might be interested in having this discussion and I look forward to those conversations. Um, thank you again. And Dr. Ogle, I'll pass it back to you. Great, thank you. Thanks, Nathan. Um, so building on that, and you saw the little curly cue that Nathan showed, um, we are trying to move some of those basic science discoveries to um, the exciting and relatable road to therapy that I think gets a lot of people excited. Um, but it's important to know exactly where we are on the road. So at the University of Minnesota, <clears throat> You can check out in your program that all of the faculty hear about the excellent research that's going on. You'll find as you peruse that most of what's going on is either in the very basic early in a dish types of studies moving into the preclinical phase. And just as a few examples of what's in the preclinical phase, we have Ann Parr who has been using neural stem cell transplantation to recover motor function following spinal cord injury. Also, Deb Farrington has been generating stem cell-derived retinal pigment epithelial cells in an attempt to cure macular degeneration. And also, we have Walt Lowe, who's been using cord blood-derived stem cells to treat the effects of ischemic stroke. So those are preclinical, and as I said, there are many more of those studies on campus. In terms of clinical studies, those that are in the clinic, uh, you might know that the University of Minnesota is a pioneer in bone marrow transplantation, which is a type of stem cell transplantation. They've been doing that for years um, quite successfully. Uh, our keynote speaker is also an expert in this space. But beyond stem cell transplant to treat blood disorders um, that you'll hear from today from our keynote, there are, also, there are actually very few FDA approved stem cell based therapies um, to treat other types of disorders beyond blood disorders. But three of them started here at the University of Minnesota. First, uh, Jacob Toller, Dean of our medical school and the former director of this institute, is using bone marrow derived cells to repair skin of children with epidermal lysis bullosa. Second, Rita Perlingero has identified a unique population of muscle progenitor cells derived from pluripotent stem cells and is on the verge of a therapeutic for individuals with muscular dystrophy. And finally, Bruce Welchek, um, has worked to support the development of pluripotent stem cell derived natural killer cells to treat cancer. 
So with all this said, uh, you have a bit of a glimpse into our current stem cell research and treatments at the University of Minnesota. And as proud of, as we are of these achievements, um, we are equally connected to the advances in and limitations to regenerative medicine across the nation. And so our keynote speaker is, we're so fortunate to have him today. He's uniquely poised to share with you this international perspective, a little of the history and where we are today. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Professor George Daly. He is the Dean of Harvard Medical School and the Caroline Shields Walker Professor of Medicine. He's an internationally recognized leader in stem cell science and cancer biology, and his lab aims to define fundamental principles of how stem cells contribute to tissue regeneration and repair. Interestingly, in 2004, he served as the founding member of the Harvard Stem Cell Institute, um, and he's been a principal figure in developing international guidelines for conducting stem cell research and for the clinical translation of stem cells, particularly through his work in a, a society we call ISSCR. It stands for the International Society of Stem Cell Research, for which he served in several leadership positions, including their president. He also has testified before Congress, spoken forums worldwide on the scientific and ethical dimensions of stem cell research and its promise in treating disease. He has numerous, numerous accolades and awards. Um, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine um, and the American Society for Clinical Investigation, among others. Uh, amidst all of these accolades and achievements, he has spent a significant amount of time and energy engaging with the public to provide clear information about the state of stem cell biology and regenerative medicine. And that's why we're so pleased to have him today. So with that, I turn it over to you, Dean Daly. Thank you. Brenda, thank you very, very much. I'm going to uh, share my screen and hopefully this will go off effortlessly. Uh, people can tell me if it's working. This looks good. Are my, are my slides up? Yes. Perfect. perfect. All right. Well, um, I, first and foremost, I want to congratulate uh, your stem cell center on 20 very illustrious years. Um, your community uh, enjoys many, many resources and amongst the most important are your outstanding faculty who have a tradition of tremendous innovation and contribution to not just stem cell research, but to all of the translational applications of new cell therapies. And um, I'm gonna give a bit of a history, a bit of a whirlwind tour uh, that takes us back to the origins of cell therapy uh, and then brings us up to date, uh, which I hope will uh, lay the foundation for our panel discussion, where we'll talk about where stem cells and cell therapy and gene therapy are today and where they might be going in the future. Uh, I want to first, though, acknowledge uh, that I have a very close personal relationship uh, to many of the investigators at the University of Minnesota. I've enjoyed a long-standing um, collegial relationship with Bruce Blazer and John Wagner and Jacob Tolar, now one of my fellow deans. But it all really started with these two remarkable scientists, uh, Michael Kaiba and Rita Perlingero, who joined my lab as some of my first postdocs um, and I was unfortunately one of the last in the lab to recognize that this scientific collaboration uh, was progressing towards a more personal collaboration, which has uh, led to this uh, wonderful couple becoming not just uh, great scientists and great contributors to the University of Minnesota, but uh, also building a, a wonderful family life. Uh, Michael and Rita were remarkable scientists complementing each other's uh, skills and producing some of the most important papers to come out of my lab. Uh, indeed, the, the first demonstration that we could achieve the development of hematopoietic stem cells from embryonic stem cells, mouse embryonic stem cells at that time, um, which has really been the backbone of the last 20 years of research in my own laboratory. And I'll take us back into history and then finish my comments with some of the recent work 
uh, that's come out of my laboratory. Well, let me let me start with the the arguably what is the dawn of uh, cellular therapy, the dawn of the cell therapy era. And it really goes back to the 1600s. Um, and in a report that was published in the, um, in the, uh, the Philosophical Transactions, it was a report of the first effort at blood transfusion. A uh, Mr. Arthur Koga was infused with lamb's blood to treat what was probably syphilitic mania. Uh, well, you can imagine this, there have been many uh, stutters and missteps in the history of cell therapy, uh, this among them, because unfortunately, uh, Mr. Koga did die. But it really showed the intrepid nature of these early investigators and being innovative and, uh, and, and assuming the risks of, of bold new therapies is really part of the history of stem cell biology. Now the notion of a stem cell, the first mention of it um, in the literature really dates to the late 1800s with the recognition that in fact, stem cells are really the seeds of our tissues in the way that seeds give forth uh, plants and uh, a remarkable array of, of flora Indeed, stem cells are at the center of a developmental hierarchy of cells within our tissues. Now, the notion that stem cells were important therapeutically actually has its origins in some of the darkest days of World War I, where the use of mustard gas had as one of its main uh, impacts on, on, uh, on soldiers, uh, devastating suppression of the bone marrow and the cytopenias that uh, in many instances led to prolonged uh, or, or delayed deaths. And then in World War II, this became very prominent with a particular raid uh, by the German Air Force on a bunch of ships uh, moored in the uh, Bari Harbor in Italy. And these ships were carrying uh, munitions of mustard gas. And many of the troops that were exposed to that mustard gas developed further extensive leukopenia, further solidifying the relationship between these poisons and bone marrow suppression. And it was in fact, these initial observations that led to the use of nitrogen mustards and the development of nitrogen mustards for the treatment of leukemias. And then, of course, we're all aware that the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki at the end of World War II um, led to a deeper appreciation of radiation syndrome, uh, the extensive loss of tissues, skin, hair, and blood and bone marrow as a response to radiation. Um, and it was, in fact, that appreciation that these tissues were uniquely susceptible to radiation-induced injuries was really part of the backdrop of our understanding of the use of stem cells in cell therapies to rescue those tissues. This became codified with the first human transplantation of bone marrow, bone marrow being the tissue shown to rescue radiation sickness in animal models. And Don Thomas, uh, with these pioneering studies, um, introduced the era of modern stem cell therapy. The first paper uh, published in the New England Journal in 1957 of the intravenous infusion of bone marrow in patients treated with radiation and chemotherapy was not necessarily a success. And indeed it was Don Thomas himself who recognized that the early uh, treatments were, were devastating to the patients. And he in fact, um, stopped his own clinical investigations to return to the laboratory. And it was indeed his studies in dogs and recognizing the importance of tissue matching and immune matching that ultimately led to the more widespread use of stem cell therapies and to the awarding of uh, the Nobel Prize to Don Thomas for introducing bone marrow transplantation. Now the science of stem cells can arguably be traced to the work of James Till and, and Ernest Bud McCulloch, two pioneering Canadian scientists 
who developed elaborate experimental strategies for measuring stem cells, the most important of which, shown here on the upper right, is the concept of the colony forming unit of the spleen. In their experiments where they used bone marrow uh, in limiting doses uh, to rescue mice with uh, lethal irradiation, they were able to demonstrate that there were single cells that formed these colonies on the surface of the spleen. And those colonies were made up of a multitude of myeloid and erythroid blood lineages. It was this set of, of pioneering experiments that um, defined the concept of a clonal single cell with multi-lineage potential, the hematopoietic stem cell. For this work, these two scientists received the Lasker Award, which is in many instances a predictor of the Nobel Prize. And um, many believe that these two deserved the Nobel Prize. Uh, unfortunately, Bud McCullough uh, has passed away recently and uh, can no longer receive it. Uh, but who knows, we may see uh, the famous uh, Till and McCullough experiments immortalized. Um, with the, with the receipt of a Nobel Prize in the future. Another pioneer in the stem cell world is Irv Weissman, who took the concepts of Till and McCulloch and the notion of a clonal hematopoietic stem cell and brought them into the modern era by the use of flow cytometry, uh, very, very transformative technology developed largely by Lee and Len Hertzenberg where the use of surface antigens on the cell can be targeted and, and used as hooks to fish out these cells. And Irv Weissman uh, is credited with the prospective purification and characterization of the blood forming stem cell, initially done in the mouse and later done in the human. And it is indeed the hematopoietic stem cell that is the therapeutic agent that we all recognize is what makes bone marrow transplantation so effective. And then of course, bone marrow is just one source of hematopoietic stem cells. A very exciting source of hematopoietic stem cells are umbilical cord blood. And indeed, this is an area where the University of Minnesota has been particularly innovative and been one of the leaders. Indeed, John Wagner, uh, Jakob Toller, uh, Margie McMillan, others, are really pioneers in umbilical cord blood transplants and bone marrow transplantation in general. Um, and this has led to the development of uh, public cord blood banks, uh, as well as private cord blood banks, um, and many very, uh, very innovative new strategies, such as using cord blood transplant to treat non-blood diseases, uh, as we heard from the pioneering work to, uh, to, to restore skin function in patients with epidermal lysis bullosa. And then with the foundations of our understanding of blood stem cells, uh, scientists started to turn to other tissues, uh, in particular here in the skin, to identify cells that were again the seeds for these tissues. Um, and one could argue that Howard Green was one of the clear pioneers in this area, uh, developing strategies to enumerate and characterize uh, the, the stem cells of the skin. And indeed, skin stem cells have found their way into clinical use uh, in products like Aplograft um, and are now the target for uh, combined gene and cell therapy for the treatment of disorders like epidermal lysis bullosa, and a related corneal stem cell also being used to treat uh, corneal defects. And with the recognition of stem cells as the seeds for blood formation, skin formation, there's now been a whole host of other stem cells characterized in tissues. Among the most well-characterized are the stem cells of the gut, uh, stem cells of the muscle, at, uh, which, which Rita Perlingero has pioneered, stem cells for certain regions of the brain that undergo renewal, uh, and then mesenchymal stem cells, stem cells that um, appear in many different tissue types as an adherent 
fibroblast-like cell that can be precursors of bone and tendon and fat. There are progenitor cells, some would argue uh, not having the same potential properties of a, of a stem cell, but rather bipotential or multipotential progenitors in the lung. There's clearly stem cells of the sperm, but these are not multipotential, but rather unipotential. So this rich literature of stem cell biology has taught us about much about the seeds of, uh, of many of the stem cells in our adult tissues. But the adult stem cells are the stem cells that we find resident in tissues um, have certain limitations. Um, they tend to have time-bound proliferation in vitro uh, and they will undergo senescence. And then importantly, it's, it, it's, it's clear that not all tissues regenerate from stem cells resident in the adult. In fact, the major part of the brain and the heart are really formed during embryonic development when we're in the womb and don't actively regenerate uh, from stem cells in the adult. So the fact that not all adult tissues can regenerate drove a similar interest among stem cell biologists in a different type of stem cell, the pluripotent stem cell. Now pluripotent stem cell biology can again be traced back to the late 1600s with the recognition of a strange type of tumor called a teratoma that arises as products of rests of germ cells. And these, these, uh, these strange tumors represent an amalgam, a disorganized uh, amalgam of different differentiated tissues. The idea that you could find hair and bone and teeth and skin in these tumors suggested that they might arise from a cell that was highly multipotent and even pluripotent, able to give rise to all the tissues of the organism. Pluripotent stem cell research was really catapulted into the modern scientific era by Leroy Stevens, uh, working at the Jackson Laboratory and noting in strains of mice, the spontaneous appearance of various testicular teratomas, tumors, that could be transplanted between mice, uh, tumors that could be established in cell culture, and under those conditions could be shown to give rise to this broad array of tissue types. And indeed, it's the 129 strain of mice in which these first testicular teratomas arose that became the precursors for derivation of embryonic stem cells. And the embryonic stem cells are the natural pluripotent stem cells of the early human and or early mouse embryo as first cultured by Martin Evans and by Gail Martin. Um, and indeed, these two titans of stem cell biology were really responsible for issuing in the modern era of pluripotent stem cell biology. Um, Martin Evans received the Nobel Prize for that work. It was quite controversial that Gail Martin didn't participate in that Nobel Prize. Gail had been a student, um, a trainee, pardon me, in the Evans Laboratory, but it's really uh, Gail Martin herself who coined the, the nomenclature of the embryonic stem cell. In, this is now going back some 40 years, and the isolation of mouse embryonic stem cells ushered in a revolution in mouse biology. Um, because together with efforts to gene modify embryonic stem cells, this led to the development of um, many, many thousands of strains of mice, genetically modified models of human disease that have really been tremendous in their contributions to understanding human disease biology. Arguably, the era of modern stem cell biology was really catalyzed by the um, the pioneering work of, of Jamie Thompson, who in 1998 published the first isolation of similar embryonic stem cells from human blastocysts. This was work that would not have happened without the visionary support of Mike West, who was an industry scientist working for Geron and actually financed 
much of this early work because it was not financeable through traditional National Institutes of Health grants. And indeed, it was that challenge, this idea that uh, these important seeds of all human tissues um, were unfortunately derived from human blastocysts, and that was in and of itself controversial. Uh, and that led to a decades-long set of debates uh, about the importance of this cell. Here, the cover story of Technology Review in 1998 was about the biggest prize in biotechnology, the embryonic stem cell, a cell that could be used to grow any type of human replacement tissue. But it was controversial and many companies weren't willing to enter the fray. This led to this decades long battle over stem cell biology and stem cell science. Now, often the case, uh, necessity drives innovation. Um, and it was indeed efforts to find alternatives to embryonic stem cells um, that led Shinya Yamanaka to a breakthrough. Simply trying to understand the potential hundreds of different genes that distinguished the behavior of embryonic stem cells from their differentiated counterparts, Yamanaka and his colleagues did a remarkable screen uh, identifying 24 transcription factors that were candidates for explaining the differences between embryonic stem cells and differentiated cells. They first introduced all of those candidates into fibroblasts and isolated embryonic-like cells and then in a brilliant experiment, they subtracted a single one of those candidates and repeated the experiment 24 times and isolated the now famous Yamanaka reprogramming factors. The four genes, OC4, SOX2, KLF, and MYC, that can convert any differentiated somatic cell back to a pluripotent stem cell that he labeled induced pluripotent stem cells or IPS cells. He and uh, Conrad Huckelinger and Rudolf Janisch went on to show that these cells could in fact be the functional equivalent of mouse embryonic stem cells generating chimeric mice and germline transmission. And that paper that was published in 2006 earned very uh, justly Shinya Yamanaka the Nobel Prize for proving that you could in fact turn back the clock of differentiation to reestablish the embryonic potential of all cell types. Now in 2006, when this paper was published, it set off a worldwide race to ask whether or not these same factors could reprogram human cells. And it's a testimony to the robustness of this strategy that within a year, there were three different laboratories uh, that actually uh, demonstrated within a few weeks of each other the successful reprogramming of human cells with Yamanaka-like factors, Jamie Thompson's, Shinya's lab, and our lab very soon thereafter. And this led us to the ability to use this reprogramming to capture uh, in a Petri dish the stem cells from a whole variety of individuals with various genetic diseases, such as genetic diseases of the bone marrow, uh, like Gaucher's and combined, severe combined immune deficiency, but also of the muscle, Duchenne's and Becker muscular dystrophy, and then more complex genetic conditions like, like Down syndrome. And it's this work, this ability to use reprogramming uh, from any differentiated somatic cell of a patient that has allowed us to generate patient-derived induced pluripotent stem cells use them for various disease models, um, somewhat uh, less promising, but still realized and, and perhaps showing more potential in the future is to be a, the ability to use IPS cells in drug screening. And then of course, the holy grail of the stem cell world is to be able to take patient cells, repair their gene defects, differentiate them into the tissues of interest for the disease, and provide a novel kind of cell therapy. The first efforts to provide cell therapies from pluripotent stem cells actually used embryonic stem cells, uh, a product of the efforts of the Geron Corporation that uh, was led by Mike West, whom I referred to earlier. This was the attempt to treat spinal cord injury 
with oligodendrocyte progenitors derived from embryonic stem cells. The first patient was treated uh, just about a decade ago. Uh, but unfortunately, because of the challenges of stem cell applications, uh, many of them political and funding, but also uh, scientific and, and biomedical, the Geron Corporation decided to stop that development. It still continues to percolate today through, through other entities. But a more promising area of stem cell derived therapies has been the use of stem cell derived retinal pigment epithelium in attempts to treat macular degeneration. Uh, these early studies were pioneered by Bob Lanza and a company called uh, Advanced Cell Therapy and has now been absorbed into Astellas Biopharmaceuticals. The most recent data published in 2018 shows some promising safety and perhaps some stabilization of disease, but I think it's um, fair to say that uh, embryonic stem cell therapies for macular degeneration um, continue to need further refinement because they have not yet proven what we all hope is, is, is their longer term promise. The first induced pluripotent stem cell therapies were also for the treatment of individuals with macular degeneration. And this was work that was pioneered by Masayo Takahashi in Japan. And interestingly, this was a very intrepid uh, way of applying cell therapy for the treatment of disease, but it was also a lesson to the entire world that this work had to be done with great care and prudence because um, of the first couple of patients that were treated, some of the cells developed genetic abnormalities that led these very cautious researchers to actually uh, halt their initial attempts at autologous stem cell therapies. This is, I think, a great lesson to all of us that with innovation and with new therapies also comes new risks. And it's incumbent upon all of us to be thoughtful and be prudent and cautious as we bring this new field forward. In other areas, we see the application of pluripotent stem cell derived cardiomyocytes and as uh, pioneered by Rita Perlingero, pluripotent stem cell derived uh, muscle cell progenitors. Here, through the work of Chuck Murray and Gordon Keller and colleagues, there are strategies for bringing these forward for restoring pump function in the heart. In another very promising area of cell therapy from pluripotent stem cells is the ability to derive dopamine expressing neurons. This has very much uh, been pioneered by Lauren Studer uh, and other colleagues, and this is being poised for clinical application in the treatment of Parkinson's disease. And interesting in uh, our community at the Mass General Hospital has actually been the first uh, use of uh, iPS-derived dopamine progenitor cells for the treatment of Parkinson's disease in a single patient suggesting that this can indeed be done now safely uh, and can be applied more broadly as we will see in the coming years. And as a direct recognition that cell therapy has now reached arguably a new inflection point, a stage where there is now widespread investment by the venture capital community, has been the founding of several new companies recently uh, one such company, Blue Rock Therapeutics, has uh, earned a very, very large financing of over $200 million to bring both cardiac and, uh, and Parkinson's therapy uh, to the clinic. In another area of great promise is the ability to generate beta cells, insulin-producing cells of the pancreas that are destroyed in diabetes from pluripotent stem cells. Now there is controversy as to whether or not there is a true adult stem cell that can regenerate insulin producing beta cells. But I think the predominance of evidence suggests that the insulin producing beta cells are laid down during embryonic development and don't actively regenerate. And therefore the sources are most uh, productively from pluripotent stem cells. Doug Melton, my colleague at Harvard, 
uh, and others at the company Viasite have been poised to bring this into the clinic and we await further data from the Viasite trials. Further evidence that this area of research is now inspiring the commitment of astounding levels of investment from the venture community and from biotech. The biotech company Vertex recently paid almost a billion dollars to commercialize the research coming out of Doug Melton's lab and the company Sema. And we'll be seeing this kind of remarkable commitment from the, uh, from the biotech community in years to come. And then finally, let me speak about the area that my lab has been focused on and indeed has been the work of many investigators, including Dan Kaufman um, of your community. Dan, while working with Jamie Thompson, was the first person to show you could derive blood cells from human embryonic stem cells. And now there are many different groups that have successfully demonstrated the development of red cells, platelets, T cells, B cells, NK cells, and hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cell sources. And this holds tremendous promise for taking us all the way back to the origins of the first cell therapies as blood transfusion. Let me just speak for the last couple of minutes about CAR T cell therapy, this new form of immunotherapy for cancer that has proven tremendously transforming for the treatment of patients with lymphoid malignancies very, very refractory diseases um, that had been uh, difficult to treat uh, by, by chemotherapy and would often warrant bone marrow transplantation as a, as a curative strategy. In this therapy, one uses leukapheresis or a harvesting method or pulling T cells, the immune cells of the blood, out into the laboratory where they can be activated and expanded and transduced by an artificial T cell receptor that targets these cells back to the patient's malignancy, lymphoid malignancy. Now this is a very patient specific, labor intensive and cumbersome process. It turns out because of cost of goods to be among the most expensive processes that have led to new drugs. And this is limited wider application of what would otherwise be a curative therapy. So a holy grail here is whether or not one could develop from pluripotent stem cells, T cells that could be taken off the shelf. And this could lead to a democratization of this type of therapy. And this is an area that my lab has focused on for the last couple of years. This is just to show uh, some of our unpublished data that shows that we've been developing a protocol that allows very efficient generation of T cells from pluripotent stem cells. Our T cells indeed by flow cytometry is shown on the left, show the markers of effector CD8 and CD4 positive T cells. They express the alpha beta T cell receptor, whereas many previous uh, incarnations of pluripotent stem cell derived T cells make um, a more primitive type of cell. Indeed, by RNA sequencing and looking at T cell signature genes, the cells that we generate by our protocol indeed are most closely uh, clustering with the alpha beta T cells of the peripheral blood. And we've been able to load these pluripotent stem cell derived T cells with CD19 directed chimeric antigen receptors. We can then isolate these effector T cells and show that they expand quite readily in vitro. And then using strategies to show T cell killing of target leukemia cells done here in collaboration with Marcella Moss's lab at the Mass General, we can show indeed that these iPS-derived CAR T cells are at least as robust in killing these leukemia targets as the classic peripheral blood-derived T cell populations. And we indeed are looking to uh, move this type of, of pluripotent stem cell-derived T cell into the clinic. And we do think that it's going to lead to the ability to generate T cells and other cells off the shelf. So this leads me to the final slide, which is 
really what my laboratory has been um, uh, focused on uh, ever since uh, Rita Perlingero and Michael Kaiba came into the lab and pioneered the development of hematopoietic stem cells from pluripotent stem cells. Now armed with the ability of the Yamanaka type reprogramming to establish patient-derived iPS cells, we've been able to show that we can do that from patients with any number of bone marrow disorders like immune deficiency or bone marrow failure or various hemoglobinopathies. We're armed with very efficient means of gene repair, especially the CRISPR technologies. And now the challenge has been to achieve clinical scale differentiation into hematopoietic stem cells. Leading the pack, however, we can today generate T cells and platelets and red blood cells. And I believe we're about to enter upon a new era of uh, replacing blood donation with cells that can be manufactured from a Petri dish. Now, of course, for transplantation applications, we're going to have to need to, to define strategies for either banking of HLA matched uh, pluripotent stem cells, or through a various strategies of cloaking, actually generate uh, pluripotent stem cells that are essentially invisible uh, to the immune system and could be transplanted universally for many applications in, uh, in disease treatment. Um, let me then say again that um, in the hematopoietic space, uh, there has been remarkable investments on the part of companies like Fate Therapeutics that has developed uh, Dan Kaufman's IPS-derived NK cell therapy uh, and the recent investment of hundreds of millions of dollars into a company called Century for the development of an allogeneic T cell therapy. And let me finish by saying, uh, I, I have um, reviewed together with Helen Blau, sort of the current state of the art in stem cells and the treatment of disease uh, in, a, in a, a, a piece in the New England Journal last year. And let me say that I think we are in a new era. The fact that we have seen the mobilization of literally billions of dollars of investment suggests that stem cells are poised for clinical application. And I, de I think we're at the beginning of a new mode of cell therapy where cells are used as medicines. And this gives us major opportunities in, uh, in treating disease uh, that I hope to review in the panel uh, so that we can discuss more robustly where we are today and where we're going in the future. And I'm gonna stop my screen sharing and turn it back over uh, to Brenda. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you. I wish you could hear the applause. <laughs> <laughs> Virtually. Thank Virtual you. applause. Yes, that was excellent. Thank you. And um, we'll be taking questions for Dean Daly as a function of our panel, uh, which will be coming up next. Uh, while we transition, I first just wanted to thank the administrative staff at the Stem Cell Institute, Lori Anderson, uh, Sue Kirstead and Jesse Browers for um, putting this all together and helping the technology happen smoothly. Uh, so speaking of that transition, we're going to, before the panel, just have a brief uh, stem cell pop quiz to keep your juices flowing, uh, get you engaged and able to participate in this uh, webinar. Um, the goal is to, you know, be able to help you test your stem cell knowledge, your existing knowledge, and maybe what you just learned from Dean Daly's talk, or also uh, dispel some misconceptions you may have about stem cells. So as you can see, the, the question is gonna pop up here in a PowerPoint presentation, and then you're also gonna receive a poll that, into which you can uh, add your answer. The poll is gonna pop up. You can move that poll anywhere you want on your screen, so it's out of the way. Then just please enter your answer, um, and then we'll show you the poll results. Uh, there are only four questions, so enjoy, and I'll be back right after the poll.
Well, that was great. Thank you, everyone. We have a very uh, well educated audience today. So that's wonderful. And I hope you're continuing to learn um, and enjoying the conversation that we're about to enter into. So um, and when you registered, many of you submitted questions and we've taken those questions and tried to formulate them into uh, questions for our panel that we hope will generate great discussion. You can, during the panel, insert additional questions into the Q&A. We may have time for those, we may not. Um, so we'll just have to uh, roll with it, as it were. Uh, so let me first uh, introduce our panel. We're so fortunate to have a diversity of uh, perspectives and stakeholders here today. And so I'll, I would invite the panel members to go ahead and turn your videos back on. Um, First, I'll start with um, Tony Albright. Representative Albright uh, is in his fourth term representing Scott County in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Representative Albright is a grad of Moorhead State University and spent 22 years in the financial services investment advisory industry. At the Capitol, he is assistant minority leader of the House Republican Caucus and serves as Republican lead of the state government finance division. He and his wife, Marianne, have three kids and live in Prior Lake. Uh, next, we have Kevin Flynn. Uh, Dr. Flynn's a manager of the Stem Cell and Gene Therapy Laboratory at R&D Systems in Minneapolis. It's part of Biotechni. He earned his PhD at Colorado State and conducted a postdoc at Max Planck Institute in Germany. He's been a productive scientist in the field of cellular neurobiology and developmental biology. At Biotechni, he's worked to, work to optimize cultures for the induced pluripotent stem cells you just heard about, as well as enhancing the differentiation of neurons from those iPS cells. He currently works to develop RUO and GMP products for immune cells, um, iPS cells, um, and various adult stem cell types, with the ultimate goal of applications for cell therapy and regenerative medicine. Next, we have Rita Perlingero. You've heard a lot about her already, uh, but she is a faculty member at the Stem Cell Institute, also a professor of medicine and holds the Lillehei Professorship in Stem Cell and Regenerative Cardiovascular Medicine. She earned her PhD at the University of Campinas in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and a uh, postdoc at MIT. Her lab has a long-term interest in understanding um, the molecular mechanisms controlling lineage-specific differentiation, especially to skeletal muscle. And as I previously mentioned, she's in the process of generating a stem cell-based muscle progenitor therapeutic for the treatment of muscular dystrophy. Next, we have Bruce Walchek. Professor Walchek is a faculty member of the Stem Cell Institute, also a professor of veterinary and biomedical sciences. He earned his PhD from Montana State, postdoc at Behringer Ingelheim Pharmaceuticals. He specializes in the study of leukocyte biology and a lot, has a longstanding interest in adhesion proteins and receptors that direct the effector function of leukocytes. As I also mentioned previously, he contributed to the generation of stem cell derived genetically engineered NK cells as a potent anti-tumor therapeutic and clinical studies are underway. Finally, we have uh, Patrick Walsh. Mr. Walsh is a graduate of our stem cell biology master's program. So we're very proud of him. Um, he's been working for the past 10 years conducting stem cell research in both academic and industrial settings and dropped out of business school to live the entrepreneurial dream. He's uh, now running Anatomic Corporation, a stem cell engineered firm whose technology was first developed here at the University of Minnesota in the labs of Dr. James Dutton and Ann Parr. And his company is working um, in our building in the incubator um, as they build their flagship technology, the Chrono platform, which speeds up the production of neurons from stem cells. This past year, they won the Techni Award for technical innovation in, as a startup company. They're also semifinalists in the Minnesota Cup competition and um, have received a biobusiness grant from Regenerative Medicine Minnesota. So, I think with that, we'll start the questions. We do plan to wrap up exactly at 2 p.m. So I know this is gonna fly by quickly. Um, I wanna start uh, with a question uh, to our keynote to George. And then I asked George, or Rita and Bruce rather, to also chime in on this. And when they're finished, any of the other panel members are welcome to join in. Uh, the first question is, um, 
is there a limit to the size and functionality of cells and tissues that can be generated from stem cells in a dish or in the body? What are the things that limit functionality? That's a very important question. Um, and one that uh, has really seen a remarkable uh, sort of paradigm shift in the last few years. I think much of the early um, era of stem cell science focused very much on the single stem cell and its directed differentiation into relevant tissues. Um, and what we realize is that when tissues develop naturally as you know we're evolving in, you know in, in the womb that tissues are a multicellular very complex and coordinated choreo choreography um, and we were really betraying the underlying biology to try to specify a single cell type directed from a stem cell we now I've learned that we can form what are loosely called these organoids, uh, that there is this enormous amount of uh, preordained multicellular developmental potential written into, into stem cells so that if left to their own devices under the proper, um, in the proper milieu, they'll actually form more complex multicellular kind of organoid or, or primitive organ-like structures. We've seen this in the gut, we've seen this in parts of the brain and now in other tissues. And so I think that we have to keep an open mind and not necessarily be limited. But for now, it looks like these organoids lead, generate only a certain minimal size beyond which they would need to recruit their own blood supply. So there's a certain limitation, at least at the level of, of uh, the in vitro development. I'm, I think it's very important, and, and University of Minnesota has been pioneering in the aspects of the integration of engineered strategies and stem cell strategies. Um, the kind of, uh, of work that may take us away from the limitations of tissue growth and lead us into the creation of more complex sort of tissue and engineered platforms for restoring function of things like the heart or the lung or the kidney. Great. And I think two important points that the vasculature uh, limits what can be created outside or the delivery of nutrients, um, one of the big issues, along with other stimuli that are provided in the body but might not be easily provided outside of the body. Rita, can you Four. further comment? So uh, indeed, this is a very important point. And I think the Dean Daly mentioned the, the, the number, right? And all the, what we have been learning over the years, the organoids is really important. And I think a, a key aspect also that we, has been brought more and more to our attention lately is the maturation of the cell types we, we get in the dish. And I think a key aspect is that these pluripotent stem cells, they can make every, every cell type, but we have to keep in mind the cell type each, per, each lab is interested in generating for a particular disease because they're all dip, very different. Skeletal muscle is very different from cardiac muscle. So in the, key, in the context, just to give an example, in the context of skeletal muscle, we actually have our target is to re, re, generate it in the dish as a muscle stem cell. And we have limitations in terms of how, how much we can expand that cell in the dish. And also what the cells can do in vitro and what they can do when transplanted. So, so learning or going back, that's why basic science is so important before we go into translational medicines because we really need to understand deeply uh, how to guide and how to target your cells in the dish, making sure that you have uh, efficac efficacy and you have safety and large numbers. Maturation is also another key aspect because the cells you, in general, that you generate from pluripotent stem cells are more immature. But we have learned, and you know, I, I think this is a key aspect that different labs around the world are, are 
are trying to understand is that we can induce maturation. So one key aspect that you learned recently is that the cells might be prenatal in the dish, but when we transplant, they change. So this is remarkable, what the cells, how they can be adaptable to the environment and become postnatal. And learning also those cues that are happening in vivo are key to generate a more efficient uh, product for regeneration. Great. And Bruce, did you have any additional comments? Uh, yeah, I guess uh, cell numbers and, and their the limitation in, in terms of how many <clears throat> cells you can derive from a stem cell is def definitely an important issue, especially when the derived cell is being used uh, for a cell therapy and being transferred into a patient. And so you may need many and many of these cells going into the patient. Uh, like Brenda, you mentioned our work uh, involves natural killer cells and deriving these from induced pluripotent stem cells. And a large number of these cells have to go into a patient uh, so they have a therapeutic benefit. And so <clears throat> going into a patient, this could be a half a billion uh, NK cells per dose. And so an issue is being able to expand an iPSC cell into that many differentiated NK cells. And so I don't know if there's an absolute, I'm sure there's an absolute limit in terms of how many final cells you can get from one induced pluripotent stem cell, but our limits have been just the technology in terms of being able to do that. And currently we can uh, derive about 1 million natural killer cells from one stem cell. So we get about a million fold expansion. Uh, so this is getting much better in, in this type of expansion, you can get enough NK cells to deliver to patients. And so that has, has been a limitation, but through uh, the technology involved in, in our science, we're being able to expand these cells more and more so you can deliver an adequate number for efficacy in patients. And then just as a follow-on to that, Bruce, when you think about NK cells or natural killer cells, once you differentiate them to an NK cell from an, a pluripotent stem cell, how long can they be maintained before being transplanted and maintain efficacy or functional capability? Yeah, and so uh, an approach uh, we're working on that uh, George nicely described in his presentation is this off the shelf approach. So you're using a stem cell that came not from the patient, but from another donor and you derive these cells and the idea is to be able to freeze them down so you can deliver them to a patient later on. So you're not having to deal with having to deal with generating them uh, and making fresh cells in the lab, in the hospital that then gets delivered to the patient. They can be frozen, thawed, and delivered. So by that uh, approach, their, uh, you know, their lifespan is, is much longer because they are being frozen until uh, they need to be used. Right. It sort of leads to part of my next question, which is, are there certain cells, tissues, and organs that are easier to generate and why? Or are there special considerations for the particular cell types that you've worked with or are working on that might be non-obvious or uh, just help our audience understand what are the special considerations that you take into account? Kevin, do you wanna start on that? Sure. Uh, so I think George hit a lot of these points in his talk and really it comes down to understanding development processes and understanding in vivo physiology. So in our lab, we're kind of a, a, a jack of all trades and master of none, so to speak. So we try a lot of different things and we see that there's a lot of cell types and tissue types that are easy to grow in organoids uh, forms where other tissues are a lot harder. Um, so as George pointed out, uh, the two main uh, stem cell sources that we use for uh, tissue generation ex vivo or outside of the body are pluripotent stem cells or induced pluripotent stem cells and adult stem cells. So if we just think about adult stem cells and uh, some of the examples of kind of easy to grow or easy 
um, easy organoids. Uh, by that I'm being, it's relative because it's not trivial by any means. But uh, the gut organoids, for example, are relatively easy. And I think it comes down to the, the, the physiology. Um, these, uh, so our gut is constantly renewing itself. It under, it's very proliferative. And it has this nice uh, stem cell compartment, these LGR5 positive cells in the crypt that Hans Kleber has described. And so it's constantly renewing and it's very proliferative. Uh, similarly, uh, the skin cells um, that uh, George also mentioned, uh, keratinocytes, these are highly proliferative. And it, another interesting thing to consider is the environment that these cells are in, in vivo. So these are a thin layer of cells that sit on top of a base, basement membrane. And this, we know, what the components of basement membrane are. And we have this, these nice tools that are available, Matrigel or Cultrix BME, that emulate this environment. So you can easily take these cells and put them in a nice niche that emulates this in vivo pretty well. So these are kind of examples that are relatively easy. Now, an example that I can think of, there's a couple examples. I don't know why they always tend to be mesoderm lineages that tend to be the hard ones, but maybe it has to do with the development and how it's the last tissue layer to be formed. I'd be actually curious to talk uh, more about that. But um, I think of uh, hematopoietic stem cells, for example, and how they're in a very complex environment in the bone marrow, for, so in adults. And this bone marrow is extremely complicated. You have parasites, you have the vasculature, you have the extracellular matrix, you have mesenchymal stem cells. And it's, these cells are moving around and they're interacting with all these complex um, factors just in the physical space. And then you also have the fact that in vivo, um, these are not very proliferative cells, typically. I think I read that uh, in Georgia, uh, someone can correct me, that they, they undergo a cell division once every 40 weeks. So this is uh, very difficult then to take this cell and to take it outside of the body and expect to be able to expand it. Um, um, I think some headway has been made recently, but to really get this bona fide primitive CD34 positive cell is extremely difficult. Um, so that's some examples I could think of. And again, it comes down to, I think, understanding the development and also regeneration capabilities. Because also like liver cells maybe perhaps don't proliferate very much, but they can regenerate really easily. Uh, where kidney also don't really proliferate, but they don't regenerate and also are more difficult to grow. So that's kind of my take is uh, uh, understanding really the development and the regeneration capability of the cells. And yeah, I don't know if anyone else can comment about specific, specifically about the mesoderm. I like cardiac, your realm. Also, a little bit more difficult, uh, like there is no adult organoid possible from these cells because there's no stem cell that we really know about or have identified definitively. But you can do it from iPS cells. Um, same with muscle, like uh, the satellite cells are, are very difficult and very complicated, and, but you can do it from iPS cells. Um, so it's a matter of the environment and understanding their the physiology. Uh, and yeah, like I said, these mesoderm cells tend to be the most difficult um, in my experience. And I'm sure you, uh, you, Brita is of course the expert in muscle, you're an expert in cardiac, George expert in, and uh, Bruce in hematopoietic lineages can probably speak volumes to this. So yeah, yeah I, I think I it's might... worth yeah, George, please. No, I, I, I will second that statement that among the most difficult cells to derive in vitro from these pluripotent stem cells are the hematopoietic stem cells. Had I known 25 years ago that it was that hard, I might have picked a different lineage. And you can see that Rita, having done early pioneering work in hematopoietic stem cells, got you know it found uh, f found the light and went off into a different lineage which is difficult but she's made remarkable progress in in uh in deriving muscle right i think um and rita i want you to comment too but you know in the cardiovascular space it's similarly challenging and i think one of the pieces is um the ability as Kevin mentioned to proliferate after differentiation or move and so cardiomyocytes don't proliferate much after they differentiate and move very poorly <laughs> in most cases so it's very hard to generate a very dense thick muscle tissue because of that. Rita similar for muscle or different? Well skeletal muscle, muscle. Is different from cardiac muscle so in that sense it's 
once you induce the, the fate, you instruct the pluripotent stem cells to, to go towards the cardiac, the skeletal muscle fate, you are able to give you the signals, understanding the key factors that are important to induce the muscle stem cells, you are able to generate very large numbers of those cells. There are the key cells um, in, in regeneration. But again, they are very different from the heart since the heart is not a regenerative tissue. Right. So understanding those differences when you're trying uh, to generate cell types in the dish from pluripotent stem cells for therapeutic applications, it's key. Mm -hmm. And that's just, for our audience, that's a very huge area of study right now is trying to understand what the cues are that are necessary for regeneration, why they're sometimes lost developmentally, you know, in the, with the heart, we're learning that there is a regenerative capacity early on in development, at least we think so in, in most mammals, so we haven't tested that in humans. Um, but that later on, you definitely lose that capacity. And for anyone who's had a heart attack or suffered any other damage to your heart, you know that that scar tissue replaces your muscle. Um, so that's one of the big reasons for trying to generate other cardiac muscle outside of the body to replace the damaged muscle. Anyone else want to comment on that question? We missed. Excellent. We'll, we'll move on. Um, this is getting to our translational folks who are thinking about uh, how do we get some of these stem cell based therapeutics to the clinic? And many, many of our questions during registration were what are the biggest scientific challenges? We've already been talking a little bit about that. What about financial challenges? Uh, George, you talked a little bit about the, the increasing investment. Um, but what is holding uh, investors back? Regulatory challenges, political challenges, cultural challenges. This is a very big question, but I think what our audience wants to know is what what are some of the, what will it take to keep moving stem cell therapy forward? What are the big things that you've run into that are roadblocks, and do you have any solutions, or how do you think we get around those? So um, let's start with um, Patrick. Why don't we start with you? For your company and you have a, a different kind it's not a therapeutic yet you're just thinking about a, um, a a kit to improve our ability to make cells outside of the body so what are some of the challenges that your company has run into yeah i guess uh for us at least it's kind of kind of tough to get started you know so you know we're, we're basically a startup and we're only a startup because of a, a local funding environment you know we tapped into regenerative medicine minnesota um we got local economic development grants, uh, uh, Launch Minnesota grant, for example. And without that, uh, we would have been, you know, digging super deep into our own pockets to get things off the ground. So there's always, you know, that gap of, you know, I have this thing that's very incredible that could do a lot of great things, but then it's, how do I get that into a customer's hands, for example? So that's kind of, a, you know, getting started is tough and then you know, all the different things that you need to have a successful venture are usually not even inside your company. It's a lot about the, the ecosystem. So it might be, you know, what industries are, are present in your state, for example, that could be around you that might help you, different companies that might be there. So I know, uh, you know, Minnesota is pretty well known for, you know, retail and medical device even, but you know, in terms of stem cell companies, stem cell therapeutics, you know, if there was more of that around, it's it's a lot easier to to forge a path forward. So those are a couple of things that we've run into where, you know, it could be a lot quicker if if there was more, you know, a funding and more of a more of an ecosystem. Yeah, Kevin, can you add to that from a slightly different, a big company perspective? Yeah, so we think about it as, uh, so in our company, we think about really a lot about the regulatory aspects as well. Uh, but we also think about uh, scaling up and reagent availability as well and, and the ecosystem and whether or not um, you can achieve uh, your goals. And you've mentioned, uh, some of the other speakers have mentioned, George and Bruce, uh, the scale up issue. And this is a huge problem. It can be a huge problem when you're 
um, dealing with a cell culture dish with a couple million cells and you need billions of cells and you need to make huge bioreactors, but you need a certain cytokine or growth factor. Um, it, it's expensive, uh, I know, because we, we make them at our company and sometimes you can't make them in the quantity that you need. So this is really something that we've thought about a lot. How, how can we scale this process up? How can we make these reagents uh, more readily available and at a cheaper level? Um, one example is, um, is moving from like an animal derived uh, source to uh, E. coli based uh, where you can really scale things up, but then you have issues of is the protein folding properly and other issues. Um, and we also think about it in, in um, compliance and uh, definitions and also just a, a general consensus about regulatory issues. So, you know, for, um, for materials that go into cell therapies, um, there's uh, guidelines that are presented by USP and they are then um, kind of carried out by the FDA, um, but it, it's kind of loose and the, the definitions are very vague. And so getting some of these definitions and like what, and this has to do with risk too. So uh, a challenge, I think it, it really, a lot of these challenges come down to risk, um, patient safety, um, whether or not um, the, the components you're using to grow your cells, if they're all free of risk. Um, for example, there's a big push to get away from uh, serum derived materials. And this is for a few reasons, viral contamination, immunogenicity, and uh, like these uh, spongiform encephalopathies. So, the, so then your raw materials have to be safer and you have to get away from these. But the thing about FBS is it's, it, you, can, uh, you can use it if it's readily available, you can, uh, it's it kind of easy to work with, you, it's, but it's undefined. And so, so anyway, from our perspective, we think about moving away from uh, from, from risky and, uh, and potentially uh, cost prohibitive or just not available reagents to ones that we can um, readily make and uh, are safe. So that's some of the things we think about. And, um, and yeah, I think uh, anyone moving to cell therapy has to consider really early on the transition from, uh, from what you're doing at the bench to whether or not this could become a therapeutic. And it's important to get your reagents and to understand that this is a limiting factor and that you may need something to help you push it to a scalability as well as, as, safe, as, well as safety, like transitioning away from serum, for example, and moving towards more defined um, conditions. For, for your cells, because you, as you infuse these cells into patients, you wanna make sure you, you minimize the risk from uh, other factors that might be in that cell preparation. Um, mm -hmm. So these are things that we consider um, in our company. If I can say something now, because we are going to that transition in the last few years. And, and there is a lot of myth uh, in, in questions with the FDA guidelines and serum is one of them. Uh, so definitely uh, all the components of the, the culture conditions you want to expand your cells, you want them as defined as possible. But I think it's very well known that FDA recognized that, you know, cells don't like to be without protein. So they like it. And if they don't grow, then you don't have a product, <laughs> right? So there are uh, many, many uh, cell products that have been manufactured in clinical trials, they use FPS. The catch is that FBS has to be accepted by the, by the FDA, right? So there are many companies uh, that they have that the, the batch evaluated and is in accordance with the FDA. Of course, you have to test those batches. You have to make sure that nothing will change during the production. But indeed, you know, and I think that's one of the, the points. The road is long. You know, when you're testing your cells in, in the lab, in the research lab, you're not thinking about all those details that you have to translate. Uh, it's a long road, but I think it's worthwhile because if it works, um, it's, it's really gonna be rewarding. I think that, you know, I'm not in the, in the company side, but one way I think that it's so challenged, especially in thinking from the industry side, which I have heard a lot is the risk the risk, obviously, the risk, we are thinking all the time about the risk to the patients, but I think that is the financial risk 
uh, that companies are afraid to take. Because it's not like when you have a, an enzyme that you know the reward in terms of financial feedback is going to be quick. You know the cells it, it's taking a long time to test to the preclinical work. And you have the first trial, hopefully in a small group, is it safe? You know, so it, it's a long road, and and so the 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 refund or the 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 profit um, it might take a while. And I, I hear that the industry is risk averse. Yes, <laughs> that I can corroborate. You know, I, I think the theme that's coming out here, um, and one that I bears mentioning. Um, I, you know, we have been hoping for the promise of stem cells as medicines for decades, the new kinds of, of stem cells as medicines, obviously blood stem cells and certain other limited type of skin stem cells and corneal stem cells and the like have, have been and continue to be very effective medicines. But what has limited our ability to get medicines for heart disease and Parkinson's and the like, it's really the manufacturer. I mean, we are still largely ignorant about a lot of the principles of cell manufacture. Arguably, if you go back to the 20th century, the 20th century was the era of chemistry in medicine. We learned how to turn small molecules into medicines. You know, we had antibiotics and we had chemotherapeutic agents and we had antihypertensives and lipid lowering agents. They were all small molecules, they were chemicals. And then in the 80s, we started to realize that we could produce biologics, proteins, receptors and the like, but it took decades to really mature that biotechnology. And now we're very, very good at manufacturing proteins as medicines. We are still in the formative days of turning cells into medicines. And uh, it's an area that really, I think, requires a lot more investment, uh, academic investment uh, in the fundamentals of bioprocess uh, engineering um, and ultimately investment from the investment community, from the community that takes risk and puts capital at risk. And I think the argument I was trying to make is that there is this sense, I think, in the community that science has progressed enough that we know which cells we can use to treat which diseases and now we need to be able to do the hard work of turning cells into a new kind of medicine and maybe it's going to take us decades to do that i think a key um, piece that we're we're kind of merging into is investment and i want to bring in representative albright finally into the conversation and you, you've been <laughs> patiently uh, waiting and, and we so appreciate you being here, but um, you know, the state of Minnesota has already invested in uh, stem cell research and I know listens to requests every year um, and is uh, education and all of that is underway. So I'm curious to hear from a political standpoint and how you interact with your constituents, what does investment look like and what are the challenges to, uh, to state investment? Well, first of all, I want to thank each and every one that's on this call. The work that you're doing is um, personally very gratifying for the sake of where uh, your vision takes the state of Minnesota in the decades to come. Uh, it's, it's exemplary work. It's needful work. It's also uh, uh, a reflection of uh, shoulders that we all stand on. Uh, from work that was uh, generated both at the University of Minnesota and at the Mayo's and at other places uh, decades ago. Um, I've heard uh, from other uh, commentators on this call about the, uh, you know, the, the, the risk or the risk averse nature of your, of your work. Um, I walk the halls of the Capitol on a, on a regular basis, and if there ever was a place that was both protagonist and antagonist at the same time, uh, I would be uh, front and center to that. Uh, but I can assure you that there is a, a, a growing sense as we look at uh, rebuilding uh, from the effects of COVID and, and, and other factors that uh, really have impacted the way that uh, citizens look at what kind of a state do we want to have 
for future generations. And the work that you're doing really isn't so much about uh, creating opportunities per se, um, you know, two, five, you know, seven years from now, but really for, for generational impact. Uh, so if that's an encouragement, please take it as such. But uh, I do think that there is a strong commitment to medical research. There is a strong re uh, uh, response to, as uh, I was a co-author on Re Regenerative uh, Medicine Minnesota uh, uh, enacting language. And I think that is the kind of the tip of the iceberg, if you will, for recognition that, as I've heard uh, Mr. Walsh and others say, it's a difficult environment uh, to, uh, one, plant seed, but actually to nurture that sapling, if you will, an environment right now where Minnesota really is a flyover state, uh, either going to the East Coast or the West Coast for um, uh, investment dollars, if you will, for venture capital. I think that's changing a little bit with recognition of what we're doing in Minnesota. And I do think that the work of the RMM is really uh, putting a, a, a spotlight on uh, what we're doing here. We're a quiet, uh, if you will, outpost, sadly to say, in terms of um, medical research on the cutting edge. Um, Minnesota NICE uh, has uh, got to be transformed into something that talks about being bold and to be a, a little bit more persistent and letting people know that, you know what, we're nice people, but uh, we're dogged in our pursuit of uh, research as well as discoveries that impact globally. Uh, and I, I would think nothing more than um, of that, of, of this conversation that this will have generational impact. You know, we, we face uh, an election coming up, not to get political or too political on it, but I do think that the ramifications of that on the state level really speak to uh, an emphasis and where those emphases will be uh, for research, for medicine, uh, it's, it comes as no surprise to anyone that unfortunately uh, the economics of the state of Minnesota are, are very precarious uh, with regard to the economic uh, uh, engines that have been really sidelined and or in some cases decimated uh, by uh, the activities and uh, the invisible nature of of actions taken over the course of the last nine months. And so I'm very hopeful that uh, we can assert uh, our, our Minnesota uh, heritage and, and, and hit the ground running with regard to uh, emphasizing that which is going to really propel Minnesota and our research uh, institutions into well into the mid part of the 21st century by what we're doing today. So. Uh, Personally, you have my commitment to the RMM as, as always, and uh, I wanna make sure that we expand upon that theme and that thesis for the benefit of those that are on this call uh, and support you in your work as well. So thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you so much. I mean, it's very heartening for us to hear that. I think that, you know, just plug in that I think the state of Minnesota has been uh, forward thinking in their uh, perspective on stem cells. And I think that's going to realize great benefits because I think we built the medical device industry and that's been outstanding. But that is much like a drug therapy where you put it in, it does its function, but then the body responds. And then you gotta figure out how we're gonna deal with side effects and, and other secondary outcomes that we didn't expect. Whereas in principle, a stem cell based therapy is a cell. It has a little brain of sorts and it's responding to the response of the body. So I think, um, you know, everyone on this call wants, you know, the entire world to reap the benefits of regenerative medicine. But I think the resources in Minnesota can be put to very great benefit to move it, us into what I call responsive therapies with stem cells. I, I couldn't agree more with that, uh, Brenda. And, and I think often, and I'll just be short in my, in my completing comment, you know, the governance is really about acting as a catalyst uh, for the efforts uh, made on behalf of private enterprise and, and our public private partnerships. And, and, the, and, and I draw on this about the partnership and the definition of that is that uh, I really view this as a partnership that is, is absolutely imperative to continue. Uh, 
it isn't that one side or the other is control, but it is a partnership res uh, responding to and recognizing our roles uh, and, and and the emphasis of uh, support one another in, in those endeavors. So uh, it is an important partnership between uh, the folks that are doing the research and the folks that can help uh, get um, those barriers removed uh, from moving forward in a more expeditious with greater momentum. Excellent. Just a quick comment about the private investment. I just want to say that I, I agree that, you know, the government uh, government impetus uh, helps get us off the ground. But uh, I, just from my company standpoint, we are investing quite a bit and responding to the need for uh, reagents for regenerative medicine. So we're building a whole new GMP facility in St. Paul. And this is a huge uh, investment. Of, uh, I forget the exact numbers. We're talking 50 to 100 million range. Um, so there's a huge investment going on locally as well. So I just want to put that out there that I think um, there is a private response as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm going to keep moving on so we get to some of these last questions. Um, I'm going to skip down to um, uh, our listeners are interested in how we at the Stem Cell Institute interact or collaborate with other entities at the university uh, and other entities across the nation, whether it be uh, companies or academic institutions or state and federal government. So um, I'd like to start with Rita on this one and then Bruce. Uh, the collaboration is really in several, uh, <laughs> several levels. Um, we collaborate with different universities. We collaborate, uh, we receive funding from the National Institutes of Health. We obtain cell lines uh, from the NIH. Uh, we collaborate with companies. We have collaborated with Biotechnia, and I know this is a, it's a common for the University of Minnesota, uh, other investigators. Uh, we share material. So I, I always see this as a, a two-way road. Um, so we receive, you know, uh, reagents from, from companies in, in, uh, in terms of collaboration. And you also provide cells to companies when they are interested. Many, many instances, they are not necessarily working on stem cells, but they are working in a particular rare disease and they want to do a large screen, but they don't have the materials to do that screen. And we have the specific cell types that may be of interest, different laboratories. So the communication and the exchange uh, of your reagents happens all the time. And this is really key uh, for success and for progress. So it's really um, a very, very important and it's very fruitful for both sides. I agree. We still use uh, cell line we got from you and Michael quite <laughs> regularly. So it's been very fruitful for us. Good to hear. Bruce, anything further to add? Any sort of unique collaborations that you have um, established that have been particularly um, useful that might um, spur others on the call who are in academia or in the uh, industrial community? Sure, as uh, Rita said, uh, collaborations and partnerships are just essential because this field is so complex and complicated you don't know how to do everything or get it done in your lab. Um, so you need to bring in this expertise uh, from other people uh, to work in a collaborative manner to get this stuff done. And these collaborations work in, in different ways. Uh, they may be initiated by the ways we communicate our science through uh, seminars and our research articles and people hear or read those and then may contact us uh, to uh, facilitate a collaboration and, and vice versa. That's the way it works for us too. Um, but in terms of uh, companies, uh, that is a sort of a different process uh, in a more of a complicated process in, in certain uh, respects. Um, and, and it's facilitated in different ways. Um, let's see, uh, George brought up Fate Therapeutics, and this is a company we work with, again, with these NK cells derived from induced pluripotent stem cells. They have a program in terms of deriving these cells uh, to deliver to patients. 
this uh, particular molecule that we designed that we put into these uh, natural killer cells is being used by fate uh, to be given to patients. And this collaboration arised from just uh, other investigators that were part of our team had interacted with fate. And so that helped establish that connection between my lab and that company. And that's been an extremely productive and career changing collaboration because again, they've taken something we dis uh, I guess discovered and um, evolved in our lab from our work and put it into these cells and now trying to see if these cells uh, have a therapeutic benefit in, in patients. And so that's been a lot of fun. It's nice to see our research, which is ba mainly basic research where we try to understand how the immune system works. But to take that uh, into a clinical setting is, is uh, very fascinating. Um, and so uh, these collaborations with companies work in various ways. Uh, that is how uh, it uh, was set up with FATE. The University of Minnesota has the, what, the Technology and Co Commercialization Office. They are there to help us facilitate um, interactions uh, with uh, companies out there with the products that we are trying to uh, have developed in our lab. So that's been a nice mechanism of um, interacting with, with companies in, in uh, finding ones that are interested in what we're doing to, again, try to develop a therapeutic purpose. Uh, so these partnerships are absolutely essential. They develop in many different ways. Sometimes they don't work, um, and many times they develop into career-changing opportunities. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. I want to switch gears now a little bit, and this is um, going to start by directing this to George. When you think about stem cell therapies, and we've been talking about the amount of money it takes to generate and how expensive these therapies ultimately are, at least in these initial stages. And of course, when you have an expensive therapy, you start to think about increasing health disparities. And so I wonder if you've thought about that and thought about how the field can be proactive in reducing the impact of stem cell therapy on increasing health disparities. Yeah. The COVID experience has really shown a very bright light on the deficiencies in our healthcare system and the just remarkable disparities in outcome of different members of our community. And it's, it's, it's made all of us stand up and take greater notice for um, how we can allocate, uh, especially these very, very innovative new therapies so that there's equality of access. Um, I can say uh, I've been involved for many years in writing international guidelines for not just the ethics surrounding stem cell research, but also its clinical translation. And very early, we installed a component of the guidelines uh, to recognize the importance of rapidly moving towards equal access for these novel biotechnologies. There are a lot of principles at work. If we're going to test new technologies, we want to make sure that we're not exploiting one population to get a, to get a, a, a trial done and then uh, giving the benefits to this new therapy to another population. And so that's, that's a principle of um, equal access to the, um, the, the testing and treatment. And I think that's an, that's an important principle. We have to recognize though, that these, these are likely to be expensive therapies in the early days. They're requiring a lot of investment, a lot of risk capital, um, but we do hope that these costs come down over time and that that will lead to a greater democratization of these therapies. Um, ultimately, a therapy has to be effective, but it's also got to be cost effective. It's got to be cost effective against uh, current treatments. And um, I'm, I've been a, a staunch advocate for that, but it's challenging. It is really, really challenging. And I, I can only hope that with a continued focus on the importance of equal access to all, 
that these new kinds of stem cell therapies will ultimately be, um, be available uh, to the wide population that could benefit. Or we see this, if I could call out a case in point, um, sickle cell anemia is a disease that disproportionately impacts um, African-American members of our community. It's been an under-resourced uh, disease, and yet with combinations of uh, gene therapy and cell therapy, we are at the cusp of being able to cure sickle cell anemia. Um, I really hope that that's one of the early triumphs of combined gene and cell therapy uh, to address a disease that has been otherwise fraught with, uh, with disparities. I think this too is an area where um, voices can be heard and I think incentives perhaps even from state and federal level to move what you just said, which is what if the therapy will be expensive early on, but to move to equal access as soon as possible and to, to somehow as a field, you know, ourselves as scientists, everyone involved pushing for that as a united voice, you know, that it's not just the next great therapy, is that the ones that we have are also uh, that the further investment is made to make them accessible. Yeah. I may just comment. I do think that ensuring access is uh, an important partnership between uh, the medical community and the, the insurance community, if you will, and state and federal governments. Um, in Massachusetts, uh, when Mitt Romney was governor, uh, he issued uh, the, the very, very influential Romney Care, which was essentially a universal provision of access through a statewide insurance program of mass health. And that has led to, I think, uh, almost universal coverage in our state. 96, 98% of individuals in our state have access. Um, that has been a wonderful aspiration uh, it was really the model that was brought forth to, uh, you know, the Affordable Care Act. We've seen that be under assault, um, and that's deeply, deeply unfortunate. And again, in the COVID crisis, we've seen the the corrosive effects of the the inequalities in our healthcare provisions, so that certain communities have borne the brunt of death and disability and. It just points out again and again, um, and in a state like Minnesota, which has such remarkable healthcare systems, I mean, the, the greatness of the Mayo and the, the fantastic uh, Minnesota, University of Minnesota Medical Center that you all represent, um, we bear the responsibility to make sure that our innovations can be applied equally and successfully to the broad base of our communities. I completely agree. Thank you, George. Um, we're getting, we're running short on time. Um, I just wanted to follow just quickly, um, Tony, in, in, I know you have a lot going on with COVID uh, and other, just an amazing time right now. But I wonder if there is, you know, like George was talking about, have, has there been legislation or thought or discussion about uh, health disparities surrounding COVID and has it brought to light other issues with our healthcare systems in Minnesota, or is that not really a point of discussion right now? I, I think that it is a, an open-ended question that uh, a lot of analysts and uh, uh, people uh, undertaking serious uh, review of that are, are I wouldn't say the jury is out on it, but I think the contemplation in terms of the ramifications, whether you're dealing with minority groups of, of various um, uh, ethnicities or whatnot. I, I think it's it's really something that the next biennial legislature will take up. Uh, but I don't know that even that will provide, you know, for a real conclusive uh, finality to it. I think it's an ongoing struggle that uh, we will face for years to come. Uh, based upon just the ebb and flow of both the economics, as uh, Dr. Daly has described, with regard to the cost to uh, con contributors. Uh, you know, we heard Patrick talk about, you know, with the risk assessment in terms of uh, capital at risk, 
uh, for those that are in the in the process of uh, bringing those to market um, out of the research lab and through this various uh, phases of, of uh, verification. Um, it's a very difficult, uh, complicated uh, subject, um, probably deserving of another call uh, dedicated just to it as opposed to um, not to be flippant, but to um, op-ed on it in a, in a cursory fashion. Yeah, I agree. I think the, the bigger point is that um, in our research labs and, and in the wake of George Floyd's death and discussions of racism across the nation, that researchers are also taking that a little bit closer to heart and thinking about how is it that their research and the direction that they're going is either propagating or alleviating that disparity. Just a, a comment that that's a view that's, um, I hope, uh, taking, taking hold more broadly in our community than it has been in the past, I would say. Um, so I wanna move just to the last question because I'd like you all to weigh in. Um, this has been a wonderful discussion. I think that we all are sort of curious to know what will happen in the next 20 years, right? what exciting new avenues are coming uh, along. And so I'm just gonna merge the last two questions the, for the panelists so you know that I would like you to comment either on new technologies that are already emerging that you think um, the audience should know about or you think will be the most transformative um, and then uh, roll into that, you know, what you see in the next 20 years, what you think is a, the most exciting thing uh, that will come forward. Um, and maybe uh, George, we'll start with you. I want to revisit a theme that um, I mentioned just in passing before, which is the power and importance of merging uh, bioengineering strategies with stem cell strategies uh, because of the limitations in being able to go from a stem cell to a whole organ. We can go from stem cells to reasonably complex tissues in these, these small conglomerates of, of organoids. But in order to integrate that into a higher functioning in terms of replacing the, the, the function of a kidney or the function of certain other more complex organs like the lung, I think we're going to need to be investing in the interface of bioengineering and stem cells. And you know, I would encourage is, you know, with, with the traditional excellence in medical devices and the community of uh, remarkable companies in those spaces uh, to promote further interactions between the engineers that think, uh, think of you know, the, the, the structure and function of devices and the biologists who tend to be more focused on the function of cells and tissues. That I think is going to be a huge area for innovation in the next 20 years. The other is synthetic biology. We don't have to be limited by what nature has given us. In fact, there's a whole new um, uh, community of engineers who are trained and steeped in systems dynamics and circuit function. And they're actually building genetic circuits into cells and creating whole new strategies for cellular functions uh, not seen in nature. Uh, and so I, I really am very excited about this interface of bioengineering and stem cell biology for the next 20 years. As a biomedical engineer, I couldn't agree with you more. <laughs> I wasn't playing to you in any specific <laughs> way, believe me. But no, that's great. I recognize uh, it. Yeah, Rita, go ahead. Uh, I think those two are major important points too. And I would like to add gene editing. I think with this is an area that we are already uh, combining um, in the context of uh, using, uh, modifying the cells from patients with genetic diseases and correcting uh, the mutations and being able to transplant the corrected cells to the patient. This, we do this in the lab, but you know, to enable this maybe in 20 years when you celebrate the 40th anniversary of the Stan Cell Institute, maybe we'll have off the shelf Cell products, that's the dream. Excellent. Great. Patrick? Yeah, I'll kind of second the notion of like the bioengineering and the cell manufacturing aspect. Um, like our, our technology was basically built out of 
a spinal cord injury research project. And, you know, to get people to walk again, it's, it's going to be a lot of work. You might have to completely rebuild the spine. You might have to completely rebuild the spinal column, the bones, the muscle, all that might have to be reconstructed. So, you know, seeing all that come together in the next 20, maybe 40 years, it might take, but that, that's what's possible. So that's, that's what really excites me. Very good. Bruce. Ah, Rita took my gene editing one. <laughs> uh, you can I'm second it. First. <laughs> I'll second it, yeah. <laughs> Molecular biology in general in terms of what we can do to genes and understand their expression patterns and, and how this changes um, along with the proteins that are being expressed uh, as these cells are differentiated into their final state. And Very good. Kevin? So there's going to be so much cool things happening in the next 20 years. I, I think all of these things are are extremely important. Developing complex tissue models is is it's getting more and more complex. So the uh, bioengineering. I was thinking about these organ on chip platforms and how now we're going to have organoids on chips. So and things like that for more of the disease modeling and uh, how uh, to. Let's study organ interactions. Also, just in general, the combinational therapies that everyone's touched upon the, with engineering, gene therapy, and stem cells. Um, like Rita said, like CRISPR-Cas9 stuff is even going further and further with single base editing and really uh, targeting, um, rather targeting um, uh, genetic uh, diseases and can combining these things for, for treatments. I, I think in 20 years, a lot of these regenerative medicine things that are just starting are going to be, are, are going to be maybe not commonplace, but more widespread. Um, cardiac patches and things of this nature. So it'll be really exciting to see. Um, one another interesting thing is uh, that I was just reading about earlier to, or yesterday is fertility, things like that, and how now you can uh, solve fertility problems that a lot of uh, people have and having a baby and you can make uh, you can make germ cells from pluripotent stem cells and you can make sperm cells so that this could solve fertility issues for many people as well um, uh, so that's Hayashi and uh, work out of there so I, I think there's a lot happening and it's going to be exciting exciting 20 years so hopefully we're all back in 20 years to talk about it <laughs> right right and Tony anything to add from perspective of the legislature in 20 years? You know, I, I, I come from a background uh, in the investment field and, and, and particularly in the healthcare field with clinicians as well as hospitalists. And one of the things that I often said, you know, demographically is that over the course of, of medicine, we've either uh, recommended or discovered a new pill, a new part, or a new place. And I do think that what we're really looking at now is a transformation of our healthcare system where none of the of those three really are going to be in play. Now, recognizing that we have yet to kind of build out the place as we age in place and as our demographic, you know, grows uh, in, in size in the retiring years. And, and so that, that becomes, you know, a common uh, theme at the Capitol. But I do think that from you know, the regenerative medicine, Minnesota, and, and the efforts that you all are undertaking, um, it's a marketing campaign. Because your your work on a day-to-day -day basis is really unknown to the, the broader populace. But yet it has uh, epic transformational uh, ramifications uh, of, of the kind of, you know, Jonas Salk with polio or or, or the, the, the discovery of penicillin. And so I, I think with that transformational effort though, you've got tectonic plates pushing against each one, of, uh, one another, uh, much like a turf battle, uh, that are going to have to be reconciled to the, 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 the revolution that's going to take place in medicine towards the patient will in effect have the ability to heal themselves by using their own tissue and their own cells. And that is, and I'll be candid about it, is an, it is an ethma and it is, a, it is a, 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 a risk to very, very entrenched 
organizations and industries. And, and, and that's, I think, the marketing campaign that we need to uh, really um, embark on is how do we partner with the patient at the center of our focus? So thank you again for your efforts. Absolutely. I, I love that last comment because it helped lead to, I was gonna try to bring together some themes and I think you heard about the complexity of stem cells, how we're taking steps forward, but that there, there are lights emerging and we're in sort of this next phase, past the hype phase of stem cells to the realization of therapy, but that it is gonna take um, communities like Minnesota to invest resources and to understand, to start the conversation that you're just talking about, Tony, that we talk as a community about this, what this big tectonic social change is gonna be and how can we do it together instead of competing with each other um, to avoid it. And then in the end, how do we make all of this accessible to everyone? So I wanna thank, I wanna just end now, I think we're right at two o'clock I just cannot thank our panel enough for being here today and all of the participants for hanging in there for two hours. Uh, I know it gets long. Um, Dean Daly, thank you so much for being with us from afar. Um, please pleasure. stay tuned. Thank you, everyone, to um, upcoming events on, the, uh, on our website. Please stay connected with us in the next 20 years. As we leave, I, as I mentioned, we'll play a short clip about the master's program. Perhaps you know someone who's matriculated from our programs or know someone who might be interested in joining us with that. Take care. Be well, everyone. Great. Bye. Congratulations and happy anniversary. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Stem cell biology is a really cool science. Pluripotent stem cells have both the potential to model a wide variety of diseases that we wouldn't otherwise be able to model, and so hopefully we can understand more about how they function and eventually treat them. And secondly, stem cells have the potential to be a therapy themselves. And that's why I chose stem cell biology, because of its, its incredible potential. The faculty at the Stem Cell Biology program is extremely supportive. They are always encouraging you to give out your thoughts and ideas, especially at the journal clubs that we have. And the community as a whole is like one big family. Everyone is very nice. You can interact with anyone you want. So it is my ultimate goal to become a uh, physician scientist and this master's program has been incredibly beneficial towards that, both with direct research experience um, but also with exposure to tremendous mentors. My ultimate career goal would be to use both basic research and epidemiological data. So the stem cell biology program is really preparing me for the basic research aspect of my goal. I'm from the Twin Cities, and so a little bias here, but I, I, love, I love this area. I love Minneapolis. The, the lakes in the cities, you know, Minneapolis is an incredibly green, green area. Just the spaces outside are incredible. Summer is like very nice and beautiful, and then falls, the colors are really pretty. So I like that transition and season that you can see throughout the year.